morning to you. It's good to see you. And um, I hope you found your regular place to sit. I apologize for not having the PowerPoint this morning. I'll have to work back into that and figure, I'll probably, I guess, have to relearn that to figure out how, how to do that. But uh, we're studying in Isaiah 53. We're really studying through the book of Isaiah. And uh, there are four sermon or servant songs, as I've said, chapter 42, chapter 49, chapter 50, and the end of chapter 52 into chapter 53. And last week we looked at this fourth one, at chapter 53, and I thought it's such a great chapter that we need to spend another week on that. So we're going to be in Isaiah 53 again today. And uh, let me remind you that all of our activities this morning... Um, are focused on God. It's not focused on any of us. All of our activities are to bring praise, glory, and honor to God. And we do that through the songs that we sing and as we open God's Word and we listen intently and we hear that Word and our prayers and the Scripture reading from Jackson. And so all of this is to bring glory and praise to God. And He's been so good to us. Uh, if you will, before we go to Isaiah 53, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'll give you a second to get there. Because what we're talking about in Isaiah 53 is, is so very, very important. It is, in the words of someone, uh, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus... In the words of an uh, uninspired person, it's the very center of gravity of Scripture. Apart from this, if Christ did not die for our sins, and was not buried, and has not been raised, we might as well just leave here and close up the doors. We have no, no business being here. And yet, the Bible emphasizes that Christ did die for our sins, that He really died because He was buried, and He has really been raised to live forevermore. And it's that hope, that resurrection, and we believe um, that he's been raised because people saw him. And that hope of that resurrection gives hope to our lives. And we've entered into that life now. It's all like some theologians call it the already, but the not yet. And so we have this life in Christ, and you were longing for the life after this life. So 1 Corinthians 15, let's begin with verse 1. And this is from an apostle. He says, Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise you believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, that He appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, <clears throat> and then to the twelve. After that, He appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me, and this is Paul saying this, also as to one abnormally born. And I'm going to stop there, but notice what Paul says that I, deli I passed on to you. It's not something Paul invented. It's something that was revealed to Paul and Paul passed it on to the Corinthians. And he says it's of first importance. What is that? That Christ died for our sins. Not just that he died, but he died for our sins. That he was buried. That tells us he really died. He didn't just some silly notion that people have put forward. He just, he just swooned and wasn't really dead. And then three days later he came to life or came back in the tomb and he had never died. He, was, he died, he was buried, and then Paul says that he was raised. He was raised from the dead on the third day. Now, if you will, go back to Isaiah chapter 53. We were in this chapter last week. I want to review just a little bit. I'm not going to go back through all that. 
But this chapter was not written by Christians after Christ's coming, trying to understand what really happened. This chapter was written by a Jewish prophet some 700 years before Christ came. And what this prophet saw was not a Messiah who escapes death, but a, a Messiah who died and who is raised from the dead. There was a quote I mentioned from someone last week. It says, it, it looks as if this chapter had been written beneath the cross, along with Psalm 22. And so this chapter focuses on the Messiah, just like all the, the four servant songs, chapter 42, 49, uh, 50, and then chapter 53. And we saw last week, the beginning of this chapter, verse 2, <clears throat> it says the humble beginnings of the Messiah. And it says that he will grow up like a tender plant. It, it's not, you look at him, you wouldn't be impressed by outward appearance of him. There was nothing comely about his appearance. It's not saying he's ugly, it's just saying that there was nothing in his physical appearance that you would think, well, this is a, a stately person. This is somebody who has a lot of dignity. This is somebody who just really commands respect. There was nothing in his physical appearance to see that. He tells us that he grew up as a tender plant. He tells us like a root out of dry ground he grew up. He was common in his appearance. And then it talks about his suffering in verse 3. He would be rejected, despised, and rejected by humans. He would be pierced in verse 5, pierced through. And I think it makes good sense that this is talking about the crucifixion. This Messiah would be crucified. He would be bruised, verse 5, for our iniquities, he says, and chastise, also verse 5 tells us. And then if you skip down to verse 12, he was numbered with the transgressors. He was not a transgressor, but he was numbered with counted, is what the Hebrew verb means, counted with the transgressors. His grave is assigned uh, it says, with the transgressors. And then it says, he, his grave is with the wicked, verse 9. He would be buried in a grave. And so he died, and he, his body was buried. Uh, John Dominic Croissant, a uh, modern-day uh, theologian, and he's interviewed on a lot of popular TV shows, and uh, he's, a, he's a theologian now, I said that. But he says Christ wasn't raised from the dead. They just took his body down the cross, threw it in a ditch somewhere. The, the, he says, I believe in the New Testament, but I don't believe in, in a real resurrection. Well, again, it's so very, very important. If Christ has not been raised from the dead, we don't have a hope. And Paul goes on to say that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He didn't suffer for his sins. It even tells us there was no violence found in his mouth. Now, this prophet tells us why this servant of the Lord suffered and died. Go back to verse, uh, we, we stop with verse 6, but go back to verses 4 and 5. He took our place in suffering. He was wounded for our transgressions. Look at verse 10. He satisfied the justice of God. The, the, the language used here is language used of the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. When they're offering all these animals, these lambs, all these animals, that's in Leviticus, all throughout that. And daily, all, offerings, all the time. Morning offerings, evening offerings, sin offerings, all kinds of offerings. And you remember when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he says, behold, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, if you're a Hebrew person, if you're a Jewish person, what do you know about lambs? Well, you know that they died. And so this Lamb, the Lamb of God, died and took away the sin of the world. He satisfied the justice of God as an offering for sin. Now, this is, this is heavy theological material here. God can't look at us and say, well, I just won't worry about sin anymore because God is a holy God. 
There has to be a payment. He's just, Paul says in Romans 3. But also, we can't make the payment. How can we make the payment? We can't do anything. And God's, uh, Paul tells us that God is the justifier of the one who has faith in Christ Jesus. So he demands the payment, but he provided the payment. He died, the last part of verse 5 here, that we can have the blessings of, of salvation. Peace, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And we talked about a little bit uh, in verse 5, this healing, by his wounds, we are healed, or by his stripes, we are healed. Peter quotes this in 1 Peter chapter 2, in verse 24. Here's what Peter says. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness. By his stripes, you were healed. Healed of, of what? The, the context there in Peter, the context here in Isaiah 53, is talking about, the sin problem that we have. Now, all that's tied up in physical problems in this life, but these passages are not guarantees that we will have physical healing in this life. And that's a mystery. I don't know. We pray for someone and we pray that they will be healed and God heals it sometimes. Sometimes God doesn't heal. I'm going to leave that with God. I'm going to trust Him um, and, and, and pray to Him, pray fervently, but leave it with Him. What this text is talking about is primarily this problem that we have of sin. Now, that uh, relates to physical healing because in, when all things are new, when the end of this world is over, there will be no more sin. There will be no more death. There will be no more suffering. And so we have that hope that we're looking at, and it's all tied up in the death of Jesus. So it's right to say there's healing in the atonement because Peter says it, Isaiah says it. In verse uh, 11, the last part, this servant is called my righteous servant, and he shall justify many. Justify means to declare right, to declare right. It's a, it's a court term, declare to be right. So notice what this promised servant was to do. He was to die. That's explicit in this chapter here in Isaiah 53. It talks a language like this. He was cut off from the land of the living. He was killed. It wasn't an accident. He didn't die of some illness in some room on the back streets of Jerusalem. He was killed. They took him and they crucified God's Son. Now, when we read the New Testament and we see that the Jewish people are responsible for that, the Romans are responsible for that, but really it's a bigger theological issue because I'm responsible for that. You're responsible for that because of our sins. And look at verse 9. So in verse 8, he was cut off from the land of the living and then verse 9, he was assigned a grave. They made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence. There was no deceit found in his mouth. Look at verse 12. I will give him a portion among the great. He will divide the spoils with the strong. There are some statements here that the death of Jesus, the death of God's servant was planned wasn't an accident. Just verse 4, he himself bore our griefs. Verse 4, our sorrows he carried. Verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. Verse 5, the chastening of his well-being fell upon him, or our well-being. By scourging we are healed. Verse 6, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. Verse 8, he was stricken for the transgression of my people, God says. Verse 11, he'll bear the, their iniquities. And then verse 12, he bore the sin of many. That's the heart of Christianity. Christ died for our, our sins. A filled full, meaning this prophecy here from, from Isaiah. This is our only hope. And so Isaiah prophesies this. The New Testament tells us this happened. Somebody didn't just make this up. Now, go back to verse 9, this unusual statement here. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. 
He was supposed to be buried with criminals because he was crucified as a criminal. But instead, he's buried in a rich man's tomb. You remember this? Let me read you a few verses from Matthew chapter 27, verse 57. When the evening had come, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. He went to Pilate. Pilate was the governor, you remember, who had Jesus crucified. He went to Pilate and he begged for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered. And when Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in clean linen cloth and he laid it in his own new tomb. It's a new tomb because nobody had been buried in. And that he had hewn out of the rock and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulcher and departed. There's a rich man, took the body of Jesus, buried him in his own tomb in the rich man's tomb. Isaiah says, with the rich in his death. Isn't that amazing? Now look at verse 10. The middle of verse 10 says, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand as the result of the anguish of his soul. He will see and be satisfied. Now, wait a minute. All the way up to this point, we've been talking about he's going to, he's going to die. He's going to die. He's going to be buried in, in a grave. And you bury dead people. So he's going to die. He's going to be buried. And yet, he's dead. What's going on here? How can he see his offspring if he's dead? How can he prolong his days? You'd have to be alive to do that, wouldn't you? To, to see these things? And so this is a confession, I think, of the resurrection. Verse 10, he would offer himself as a guilt offering, which he did, and then some things will result. He'll see his offspring, he'll prolong his days, and the, the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper. And so he dies as a sin offering for our sins, and yet he will see his offspring, those that he saved. How will he do that? He will do that because he will be raised from the dead. And that's what the New Testament teaches. Look at verse 11. There's triumph now after the resurrection. After he suffered, he will see the light of life. He will see and, and be satisfied. He sees the fruit of his death and he's satisfied with that. He justifies many. He is the living Christ. He, he will bear their sins. Then look at verse 12, the last verse of the, of the chapter. Therefore, and therefore is a conclusion. Therefore, I, and the I here is God, speaking of his servant, I will give him a portion with the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong. He'll be satisfied. He'll be raised, and God says, I will give him a portion with the great. New Testament says Christ died, he was buried, he was raised, and when he was raised, he overcome all, all evil. And he's satisfied in what, what he has done. He delights to, to save. Now we're going to close. I mean, you know, we can spend a lot of time in this great chapter, 53. But I want to carry you like we did last week over to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8. In the book of Acts, the gospel is spreading out from Jerusalem. And the gospel, you remember, is the death of Jesus, that he died for our sins, and that he was raised. That's what they preach. And it's spreading out from Jerusalem. And we come to chapter 8, and Philip goes down to Samaria. And he preaches. And the end of that chapter, verse 26, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. And so he started out. He is, a, he is a, an obedient servant. And on his way, he met 
an Ethiopian eunuch. And we're going to learn more about him. He is someone who is, uh, who is going to listen to God as well. And so Philip meets this Ethiopian eunuch, this court official. He's an important official in charge of all the treasury of Kandaki or Kandasi, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. He's a proselyte. By the way, kind of file this way in the back of your mind, in Isaiah, we're going to get into some discussion about eunuchs worshiping. And we're going to come back to this. But notice, verse 28, on his way home, he was sitting in his chariot, he was reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. That's the scroll of Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah is a long book, 66 chapters. The scroll of Isaiah the prophet is a pretty big scroll. It costs a lot of money to have a scroll like that in first century. The Dead Sea Scrolls, you've heard of those? Uh, the scroll of Isaiah is a long scroll. It's, it's displayed. You can see it there in Jerusalem. So he has this scroll. He, he has some money to be able to have his own scroll. But he's reading from the book of Isaiah the prophet. And then verse 29, the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. So there's no question what he's reading. He's reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. And that's a good question. It means we're reading scripture. It's not just in your daily Bible reading. I hope it's not just mindless reading. Do we understand what we're reading? It takes effort to understand what we're reading. How can I? He said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please. Who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage. That's Isaiah 53 and those verses there. And told him the good news about Jesus. Is Jesus in that passage? Yes, because that's where Philip began. He took that passage and he preached to him the gospel, the good news about Jesus. What do you think he told him? Well, he told him that he died for our sins, that he was buried, that he's been raised, lives forevermore. You think he said anything about putting faith and trust in Jesus as, as Messiah? Yes. Do you think he said anything about baptism? Well, look at verse 36. They're traveling along and they come to some water and, and the eunuch says, here's water. They, they didn't pull a water bottle out from the bottom of the chariot. They, there's, there's water. It's a body of water. And he says, what can stand in the way of me being baptized? And basically nothing. And so he gave orders, the chariot stop, stopped, and Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. They both went down into the water, Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch didn't see him, but notice the effect on the eunuch. He went on his way rejoicing. Why? Because he knows he's saved. He knows Messiah died for him, that he is buried, that he's been raised again. And he knows that through this confession of faith and through baptism, that he is now a child of the Messiah. And then goes on to talk about Philip goes around preaching other places. And we're going to sing the invitation song that Stephen announced. Isaiah 53 begins with, Who's believed our report? That's a good question. Who's believed our report? Most of the prophets preached and prophesied and nobody believed anything that they said. Jeremiah preached 37 years and nobody took him seriously. They even took, said that you're a traitor and they threw him into a pit. 37 years. And God said, you keep preaching. That's your work. So who's believed our report? Now, as we think about Isaiah 53, do you believe that report? Do you believe what it, what it says, that Christ is the Messiah? He died for our sins. 
and then he's been raised to live forevermore. The eunuch believed that because the eunuch says, I need to do something. And here's water, what keeps me from being baptized? As we sing this song, if you're not a Christian, we call you to do what that, that eunuch did. Put your faith, your trust in, in Messiah, confessing his name and being baptized. You were raised up then to walk in a new life. If you've done that and you're living in sin, you've wandered away, um, then you need, to, you need to think seriously about your relationship with God. And the good thing is God is a gracious God. God forgives when we come back to him. When we come back and, and once again renew our trust and put our faith in him. So it's our, our prayer if you need to come uh, this morning that you'll do that. We're ready and uh, we're praying, but that you'll do that while we stand and while we sing this song.